fellow sports fans, sports collectors, and all hobbyists, welcome to the Card King Sports and Variety Show. I am your host, the Catman, Brian Cataquit, a.k.a. the Card King. We are live on ABC's KMET 1490AM.com. Your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. And I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. Uh, we do have a guest scheduled to come on, so we will await her phone call. And on the telephone line, I welcome to the program a former pro tennis Hall of Famer. We welcome in the great Gigi Fernandez. Gigi, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, I appreciate you doing this. I, I really do. It's an honor. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I want to begin. Um, Gigi, your amateur and pro tennis career is an epic one. Uh, very difficult for any other to even come close to what you have accomplished. Uh, take us back, if you can, Gigi, say teenage years. Is this what you envisioned for yourself? Was tennis going to be your life? No, actually. Um, you know, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and there was not a lot of tennis coaches or a lot of tennis industry there so i'd really or competition for that matter so i didn't really practice that much when i was a teenager um but i still won in puerto rico you know when it what changed was um receiving a scholarship to attend clemson university in south carolina and that's when you know i had to play tennis every day for the first time in my life because i had a scholarship and it was my responsibility um so that's kind of what what set me on track and really the first time I thought that I could be a professional tennis player was after making the finals of NCAAs uh, as a freshman. But, no, I definitely not as a junior. It was, uh, you know, it was good, but I, I never thought it, that I would have, definitely have a Hall of Fame career. Now, during those beginning years, Gigi, you were making frequent trips to junior tournaments and received a handful of college scholarships, like you mentioned, and you chose South Carolina. Now, you chose Clemson. Is that correct? I sure did. Now, and I know South Carolina because I attended USC myself. Uh, why Clemson? Because the coach called me more. <laughs> Not, you know, and then when I got there, the coach had left. So, um, so the coach that recruited me ended up not being my coach, but, um, yeah, I mean, I had scholarship offers from some schools in Texas and Florida and, you know, and I kind of had narrowed it down geographically to either North Carolina or South Carolina. So I had to pick between, um, UNC Chapel Hill and Clemson and I chose Clemson and, um, without visiting either school, which was another mistake, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. So, so was that Coach Andy Johnston? That's right. Yeah, he he was who was he was not who recruited me, but he was who was there when I when I arrived. I mean, legendary coach, a Clemson Hall of Famer, no question. Um, yeah. So you so recruited to Clemson from your roots in Puerto Rico. Uh, you reached the National Intercollegiate Singles Finals your freshman year. And then off to the pro level within six months. I mean, that's pretty impressive how quickly you reach the pro level. Yeah, so, you know, back back in the day when this was happening in the late 80s or mid-80s, pro uh, college players had pro rankings. So the girl that I lost to in the finals, Beth Herr, had a ranking of 27th in the world. So, you know, I, but the score was 7, 6, and a third. I had match points. So I, I knew that I could compete with this level, and I played summer tournaments, you know, challengers, and got a walk out into the U.S. Open. And then I was going to go back to Clemson in the fall, and I asked Andy if he would confirm that I would play number one because I had played number two as a, uh, as a freshman, and I figured I had earned the number one spot because I made the finals of the NCAAs. And the girl who played number one, her, uh, her name was Jane Foreman. She was a returning senior but she had lost first round. So I figured I earned the number one position, right? So oh, he told me that I was going to have to play a challenge match for that, for that number one position. And so then I was like, okay, I'll just take the fall off. Cause I didn't want to take a chance that I, you know, in a challenge match, anything can happen, you know, wrong day of the month, wrong day of the week, you know, who knows? So I took the fall off. And after this fall, I was ranked um, top 80 in singles and top, you know, 40 in doubles. So, um, in the end, I ended up, actually, my dad ended up deciding for me that it was the right thing for me to do to turn pro and give up my scholarship. So that was a really tough decision because, you know, free education is 
nothing to be taken lightly. And I was giving that up. Um, you know, if the tennis didn't work out, then I, I had given that, that up. So fortunately, it, you know, in the end, it, it all worked out. But um, not, not an easy decision for sure. Well, I mean, tennis did definitely work out. I mean, 17 Grand Slam title champion, two-time gold, Olympic gold medalist, uh, considered one of the greatest in women's tennis, no doubt about it. Um, and reading, you know, just reading your career to me, it seems, Gigi, that you crafted your own path. You carved your own style, your own way. I mean, you were given a gift of precision at a very young age with hand and eye coordination. I mean, very hard to do because your body, as you know, needs to know how to read the incoming shot and know how to position itself to strike with power. Is that an ability that came naturally to you or you needed to work numerous hours on your hand and eye coordination? So so there's two things to that question. First, the hand eye coordination. And second, you know, the, my uncanny ability to understand doubles. So the hand eye coordination, you know, my dad and I used to play this game when I was a young girl, probably, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, and unbeknownst to either he or I, he it developed the hands that I, you know, later had. And the game was like, you know, he would stand on the service line and I would stand the op- opposed, you know, across the net on the other service line and he would take a basket of balls and he would try to hit me with the ball. He would like whack balls at me and I would just have to try to reflex him back and put him back in the court. So, you know, this game turned the hands that I had um, into what they were. And then, of course, the God-given ability to understand the geometry of the double court and understand um, the angles of it and, and be able to anticipate uh, opponents. Like, you know, I, I just got double since I was a little got since I was a little girl, when I was 12, I made the finals of the Puerto Rico National Championship in the adult division, and I won the junior double, junior doubles, clay court, um, you know, nationals at 12. So, so I was just had this kind of uncanny understanding of doubles. And, and to me, it seems like, you, like, like I mentioned, you carved your own style because I, was there anyone that you looked up to in the professional game when you were young? Um, yeah, I mean. Not when I was super young because there was not a lot of tennis shown in Puerto Rico. In fact, there was none. Like, I don't ever remember watching, you know, Wimbledon or the French Open. It just wasn't shown. Um, but when I, when I went to college and started playing, I definitely looked up to Martina and Navratilova because she had, you know, the aggressive serve and volley style that I had. Um, obviously, the greatest doubles player, greatest one of, or eight, probably arguably the greatest player in the history of the game, if you go by number of Grand Slams won. Um, so, yeah, so I definitely look up, looked up to her, and, um, you know, she was number one in the world when I was coming up. So usually you, that's who you look up to. You know, you want to be, like, the number one player in the world and, and do what they do if you want to be successful. We're talking with the legendary Tennis Hall of Famer and Puerto Rico's female athlete of the century, Gigi Fernandez, who's on the telephone line. I mean, very spe- it must be very special hearing that achievement, Gigi, uh, Puerto Rico's female athlete of the century. I mean, for us sports fans who love the history of the sport, if you were to ask me, the two most prolific Puerto Rican athletes of all time, for me, I would have to say Gigi Fernandez and Roberto Clemente. I can't think of anybody else. You got it. And he was the male uh, athlete of the century, and I was the female. So, uh, you know, there's, another, there's a couple other uh, great baseball players, you know, Pudge Rodriguez and Robbie Alomar, who are in the Hall of Fame. Um, but I don't think any of them reached Roberto's status. No, Roberto, both of you, I mean, no one reached, you know, what you, which both of you've done in your field of sport in, from Puerto Rico. I don't think no one has ever achieved it. it I don't know, in my opinion. Um, 1983, age 19, your first professional match, GG. Take us back, if you can, to your workout regimen at that time, how nervous you felt, how emotional that game was for you, your rookie appearance. So, you know, with tennis, like, when you declare that you're a pro before a tournament starts. So, you know, I had been playing tournaments kind of leading up to the Australian Open, which back in our generation, the Australian Open used to be in November. So November of my fall year when I should have been a sophomore, um, I played the tournament in Sydney and I made the quarterfinals. And then I, when I played the Australian Open, I that's when I declared that I was going to be a pro. 
Um, but it didn't feel any different than any the match I played the week before. It was just this time I knew I was going to get a check at the end, but it wasn't anything. Um, I don't remember any being more nervous or less nervous. It was just another match. How about 1988? First U.S. Open win with Robin White. You go on to beat Martina and Pamela in the semifinals, and they had a long winning streak, if I recall, at that time. Would you say yeah. that match was the most special in your career? Um, not the most special, but it was definitely set set the sort of the path to you know, to achieve what I ended up achieving because it was the first time that it was the first time you won a Grand Slam. I mean, you dream about this and you think about it um, as you're, you know, going through being a professional tennis player. Everybody wants to win a Grand Slam. And when you actually do it, then that's, you know, obviously you have the belief that you can do it again because you've done it once. But until you do it once, it's, you know, you never know if it's going to happen. Um, and, yeah, Martina and Pam, um, they, they had won 108 matches in a row which is, wow. I think, over three years without losing. And um, they had just lost that winning streak at Wimbledon. We lost her. Maybe she'll call back. So that was uh, Gigi Fernandez. Hopefully she calls back. Um, while I have, uh, while we await her call, we can, uh, I'll just mention her website. I mean, everyone listening to the program can go and take a look. GigiFernandezTennis.com. GigiFernandezTennis.com. Uh, we have Gigi back with us. Uh, I think we lost you there, Gigi. Thanks for calling back. Sorry about that. I'm driving, so yeah. I apologize to the, to the listeners if, um, we break up. Yeah, so what I did was I mentioned your website, ggfernandeztennis.com, and I was saying it's an appealing website. Um, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're involved in? It looks like you're still involved in the game in some capacity. Yeah, so about 10 years ago, um, first of all, when I retired, I took 15 years off and didn't really want to do anything with tennis. Um, you know, it's kind of burned out and just wanting to do something else in my life. But 10 years ago, I went back to tennis on, on the, on the kind of managerial side, became director of tennis at a facility in Connecticut. Um, and then I kind of rediscovered my passion for teaching or, or discovered my, pa my passion for teaching. I, I really i am a born natural teacher. It's what I love to do. Um, so I created something called the GG Method, which, which is a doubles program that you know, teaches people how to understand the game of doubles, which is very different than singles. Um, so, yeah, so I have a business that, you know, I travel around the country, going to clubs and uh, doing clinics, uh, kind of one-day events. Uh, I do multi-day camps in Tampa and Aspen in the summer, Indian Wells during the tournament. Um, and I also bring people to Wimbledon and the Labor Cup. So I have a pretty fun, successful second career combining, you know, my two passions, which are tennis and travel. So, um, yeah, life has turned out pretty good. Now, now let me let me take a few steps back to 1988. Uh, we were on that topic, and then we, you know we lost the telephone line, got cut off. Yeah. But so so from now, I don't know if this is true, Gigi. 1988 um, during that year, from what I understand, reading your career, that was a point in your career in which you were thinking of calling it quits. Is that true? Yeah, I was. Um, so I had played four years on tour at that point, and you know the thing with being a successful junior in Puerto Rico, and then you know going to college and I only lost two matches as a freshman the whole year. And then, so I, I had not lost very much, you know, in Puerto Rico, I was number one in my age group and then two above. So at 12, I was number one in the 12s, 14s and 16s at 14. I was number one in 14, 16 and 18. So, so I didn't have a lot of experience losing. And then what happens when you turn pro is you lose every single week, twice, singles loss, doubles loss, only one person wins and no one turns pro and starts winning right away. Right. So, so I just kept losing and losing and losing and losing and didn't know how to handle it. Didn't, you know, had a bad temper. I, I didn't, I was too immature really to understand that losses are learning opportunities and you can learn from it, from them. And, um, just didn't really have that skill. And I was pretty miserable. I was going to, it was homesick and tired and just not be successful. And I was going to quit when I got to the 88 U S open and I was, Fortunately, convinced by my agent to go meet Dr. Jim Lair, who is a very famous sports psychologist. Um, and he had me uh, act. He's like, he asked me if I knew how to act. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I can act. 
my great uncle was Jose Ferrer, who won an Academy Award. So maybe I got a little bit of that. And he wanted me to act like um, like I was having fun, to so go out and pretend like you're having fun. And I know that, you know, you and I both know that you're not having fun and you're going to quit at the end of this tournament, but just pretend like you're having fun. And we won the first match, 6-4 in the third. And I came off the court and he asked me if I had fun. I'm like, no. I mean, 6-4 in the third, if you play tennis, you know that's stressful. <laughs> tennis from 4 all in the third is very stressful. So they did the next match and the next match and the next match. And then now we're in the semifinals of the US Open playing against Martina and Pam. Again, just at this point, I'm kind of sort of having fun. When I, when I come off the court after that win and he says, are you having fun now? I'm like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? I'm the finals of the US Open. So I ended up winning the US Open pretending that I was, oh, my God. I, sorry. Um, so I um, ended up making the, the finals of the US Open pretending like I was having fun, ended up winning it. So, so yeah, it was um, pretty special. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, now you know this better than any anyone, Gigi. To be good at the professional game, you need to be able to, to win consistently in the big spot. You know, it's not about doing it one match here, one match there. Right. And it's you did it pretty consistently from 1992 to 1997. Uh, you were partner, partnering up with Natasha Z, winning 14 Grand Slam titles together yeah. with Natasha. And my question on that note is, how does one choose or pick a good doubles partner? Um, well, you mean how to, Natasha and I got together, or how do you pick a, yeah. a partner? Because they're two the, different questions. Like for the viewers, when, when you pick your partner, um, you want somebody that complements your style. So if you're a certain volley, you're more kind of aggressive, you want a setter, somebody who's more consistent. If you have good volleys, somebody with good ground strokes. If you have a good forehand, you want somebody with a good backhand. If you're temperamental, you want somebody that's kind of mellow. So you, you opposites attract when you're picking your partner. With Natasha and I, we came together because we actually were both dumped by our previous partners. And that, was, that happened on the 1991 um, Wimbledon final. Natasha and I were playing against each other. I was playing with Diana Novotna, and she was playing with Larissa Neeland. And um, we were uh, in a battle at on you know, center court, 5-4 in the third, uh, Yana serving, and it's 9:20 at night. And for the Wimbledon watchers, uh, at the, that was it. At cut of time at 9:20, it's dark, and we weren't going to play another game. We had to finish that game, go to five all, and then we would have gone home, um, slept on it, come back the next day, back on center court Wimbledon after the men's final. Um, and Yana has to hold her serve, and that's what happens. And you know, one of the best servers in our generation. But she proceeds to double fault on match point. So we lose the final. I'm devastated. And she, as we're putting our rackets down in our bags, she says she, she needs to talk to me. And I was like, I don't want to talk. <laughs> I was, you know, devastated. And she's like, no, 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 we got to talk. Well, unbeknownst to Natasha and I, Yana and Larissa had agreed to play together the rest of the year. So they both, we both got dumped after that final. And then they started playing together. So then the following April, Natasha and I got together. And, you know, as I tell the story, like we played them in the 92 final. And, um, you know, the dumb piece are playing the dumb first. So we really wanted to win that match. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how we got together. We were both, you know, we, we were both top five players at the time and sort of without partners um, because we had been let go by our, by our previous partners. And we played them a lot. We played them. We never lost to them in a grand. We played them in five out of the, out of six grand slam finals. We never lost to them uh, in, in a grand slam final. Um, and then they ended up breaking up. And Natasha and I, like you said, went. We won 14 grand slams in five years, which is still a record um, that holds today. I mean, like the Bryan brothers, 18 grand slams. Venus and Serena, 14 grand slams in a 25-year career. So we did it like. Fast and furious, two, two to three grand slams a year. It was a very special time. No, and I'm glad I have you on because, you know, just listening to you, you're teaching me the sport. You know, I'm not a tennis expert. I'm a baseball expert. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad I have you here. Now, um, you, played the, you played at the Australian Open, U.S. Open, Wimbledon, French Open. Which court surfaces or turf was most difficult for you to perform in? Uh, well, you know, that's a funny question because you would – like, I was aggressive serving volleyers, so naturally I would like fast surfaces like grass. Um, 
and not like surfaces like clay, but Natasha, and at which I did not when I played singles, but Natasha and won out of our 14 Grand Slams, six were at the French Open. We made seven French Open finals in a row. Um, so our best results were on clay, even though that was my least favorite surface. Wow, because you know, I read, I read, an, uh, I read a, a tennis magazine. Tennis analysts and players considered Wimbledon's grass courts to be the fastest playing surface of the Grand Slams. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, grass is and very I also, slick. Oh, go ahead. Especially good grass. Yeah, good grass is very slick. Like the grass that most people play out of their clubs, if there is anybody listening that plays on grass, is not Wimbledon grass. It's sort of soft, and the ball doesn't bounce. I mean, the, the grass at Wimbledon is, is packed hard, and and the ball really shoots through the, the surface very fast. And, and, and I don't know if you're aware of this. I recently read uh, there was a study shown in Denmark that tennis players, they have a life expectancy 10 years greater than joggers, I cyclists. I saw that. Did you did, did you know about that? Yeah, I know about this study. It was it's great. I mean, it, it's I believe it because it's. I think we lost Gigi. Well, I'm going to mention the uh, website once again, uh, ggfernandeztennis.com. And listen, I appreciate Gigi for coming on. Hopefully, we can have her back. Until next week, happy collecting to all.